A wonderful good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I welcome you here at the Technical Forum at the group exhibit Hydrogen Fuel Cells and Batteries. This year at the Hanover Fair in the year of 2015. Every 15 minutes you will hear interesting presentations regarding the hydrogen industry. I'd also like to say good morning, good afternoon or good evening to our online guests streaming from all over the world. Our next topic will be the long-term energy storage for on and off-grid applications. And for that, please welcome with me on stage the CEO of Hydrogenius Technologies GmbH, Dr. Daniel Teichmann. Big hands, please. Thanks. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for your interest. My name is Daniel Teichmann, one of the founders and the CEO of Hydrogenius Technologies from Erlangen near Nuremberg in Germany. We are a spin-off of the University of Erlangen Nuremberg and we're working on a new technology for efficient hydrogen storage. So let me start with giving you an overview over the technology we're working on and then I would like to come to the storage systems we are um, developing and constructing for long-term energy storage. I think you all know that hydrogen is actually a great energy carrier. That's the reason that you are here in the group ex exhibit hydrogen. It's an energy carrier that is clean, sustainable, it's, it's renewable, it's non-toxic and you can use it in many, many applications. Producing in it from renewable energies like wind and solar, using it to drive your future fuel cell car for heating for many, many purposes. So hydrogen is actually a very efficient, very promising vector for a future energy system. Um, not only in my eyes, I think only in your eyes. But, and this is the, uh, the point I want to come to, hydrogen also has a few difficulties in handling, in storage and in transportation. As you all know, hydrogen is the gas with the lowest density, especially regarding the volumetric density. And so it's not that easy to store large amounts of hydrogen on a limited volume, also covering aspects like, like safety, like, um, yeah, like, like all the things you know of hydrogen. And of course, compression of hydrogen is, is like state of the art for, for hydrogen storage. Um, but of course, you need energy to compress it up to 350, up to 700 bar. Then you still you need very expensive high pressure systems in the car, at the fueling station, in your uh, storage system. So it's not so easy to, to store 700 bar um, gas. And of course, this is a completely new infrastructure that we would actually need um, around the world for really deploying um, fuel cell cars, for example, but also on and off grid energy storage systems. Um, and this is, of course, a massive invest that would, would need to be taken. So uh, in my eyes, in our eyes, um, the storage of hydrogen is, of course, a vital issue. And that's uh, the topic we are working on as, as a company and uh, um, from an academic perspective at the beginning. We started in 2009 with extensive research and for two years we uh, have now a commercial company um, bringing forward this technology. And let me show what, what the technology is all about. What you can see here, of course, is production on the left side of, of hydrogen from renewable energies and on the right side, consumption of hydrogen in fuel cell cars, in house heating, in electricity um, uh, production. And what we um, developed is a technology where you can actually store hydrogen by binding it chemically to a liquid diesel-like material. So this is a reversible catalytic process, a, a chemical storage method um, where you hydrogenate um, a liquid carrier material which is actually like very similar to diesel fuel. So it has a, lo a lot of the same attributes than diesel fuel. It's a liquid, it's, uh, it has a very high storage density. You can store it without high pressure systems, without cryogenic temperatures, just in normal tanks within the existing infrastructure for, for liquid fossil fuels actually. So what you can see here is that you would take the hydrogen and then you would have the, have the loading hydrogenation process and what you get is uh, a loaded material which you can then transport in regular trucks in the regular infrastructure to the consumer and at the time and at the place of the hydrogen demand you would release the hydrogen and use it for your application and then the carrier material itself is, is not consumed but can be loaded again and used in many, many cycles. So it's actually just a, a carrier, not a, a consumption um, uh, uh, substance. And of course, the, the principal idea of, of this technology is, is not new. So there are um, publications from research from, from 20 years ago using toluene. There are some um, works from 2005 uh, from App Products working with N-ethyl carbazole, for example. 
we have actually discovered um, a quite new material um, which is actually used today in industry as a heat transfer fluid. So it's already available today, also in very large quantities, and it's quite cheap. It's completely untoxic, so it's not classified as a dangerous good for, for road trans transport, for example. Um, and it's very resistant to, to heat. And this is a material that, that we use uh, also in big quantities to store, to store hydrogen. And let me show you some of the characteristics and of the advantages. So first of all, we have a very high um, storage density. So the storage density, the lower heating value of, of the hydrogen, um, is, is 2.05 kilowatt hours per kilogram. Um, so this is factor 10 to 15 higher than, than a battery, obviously. And in a certain amount, in a certain volume, you can actually store as much hydrogen than if you would have 1,300 bar of compressed gaseous hydrogen. So you see actually the storage density is pretty high. But actually, the complexity of storing and transporting the liquid is, is very, very low, because it's just a liquid like today's diesel or heating oil that you can store in any tank and, and transport in, in trucks and on train, for example. Then, very importantly, um, it's, it's very safe, because actually, on the, during all of the storage and handling, you don't have molecular hydrogen present. So you have a hydrogenated compound, which where, of course, hydrogen uh, atoms are, are chemically bound, but you don't have molecular hydrogen with all the properties that you know of regarding safety, regarding um, explosivity, and, and these, these kind of things. So the whole handling and transportation of, the, of this liquid is, is very easy, and it's exactly the same than what we do today with, with liquid uh, fuels uh, like diesel or heating oil today. So at the bottom, you can see the actual molecule we are, we are working with. And this is, as I said, um, a commercially available um, substance as a heating transfer fluid in industry called Dipensyl Toluene. Let me just show you a few, uh, a little comparison between different uh, technologies for, for energy storage. And if you're talking about long-term energy storage, um, also, some people discuss pumped hydro storage, for example, as a mechanical um, storage technology. And as you can see, of course, the storage density is extremely low. So you have to pump 1,000 liters of water 300 meters up to store 0 0.7 kilowatt hours of, of energy. So obviously, this is very difficult to store really large um, amounts of, of energy. Then batteries, for example, are perfect for, for short-term energy storage with high efficiency um, and also high power ratings. Uh, but um, as soon as you're talking about really large amounts of energy, so talking about storage cycles of many hours of days, maybe even seasonal storage, so covering um, summer, winter times, for example, then a battery, the costs of the battery always are quite directly linked to, uh, to, the, to the storage capacity. So if you want to have 10 times the capacity, the battery is almost 10 times as big and 10 times as, as, as expensive. And this is different for um, chemical energy storage, like for example hydrogen or LOHC, because there you have a storage system and the costs are mainly determined by the power, input and output of the system. Um, but then the, the question of the storage capacity, of, so of how much energy you can actually store within the system, is only determined by the size of the tank. And this is something which is very easy and very cheap to have, for example, instead of a one cubic meter tank, a 10 cubic meter or 50 cubic meter tank. Um, and it's also very low cost. You can have extremely large storage capacities in the range of many megawatt hours um, just by, uh, by increasing the tank size of a, of a quite regular uh, fuel oil tank. So this is the technology we're working on for, for like five years. Um, and our company, Hydrogenius, is, as I said, a spin-off of the University of Erlangen. Uh, our, one of our investors is uh, the company Anglo-American Platinum, which is a worldwide producer of, of precious group metals um, located in South Africa and in, and in London. And what we are working on at the moment are energy storage, storage systems in, in containers, as you can see here on the, on the below right. And we use these systems for two, kind of, of, two kinds of applications. And the one you see on the left side, so we're talking about uh, intelligent hydrogen logistics here. So consumers with, with the need for hydrogen, for example, industry, for example, um, uh, fueling stations, today most of the hydrogen is delivered via compressed gas. And with a, com with a truck with compressed gas, you have around 300 kilograms of hydrogen only on the 40-ton on the uh, truck. 
And with LOHC, you would actually transport um, a, a regular fuel, like today it's diesel fuel, and you could uh, uh, transport around 1,500 kilogram of hydrogen on one truck. So uh, uh, around five times as much as, as with compressed gas. Um, and then you would have at the, at the customer, at the consumer of hydrogen, you would actually have a small station for the release, for the dehydrogenation of, of the material. So this um, would be, of course, transportation of hydrogen and reducing the complexity of handling hydrogen as a gas, reducing that to the handling of a liquid diesel-like uh, material. And then the other one, the other um, application that we're working on, that you see, can see on the right, these are really stationary, decentralized energy storage systems. And for these systems, we have fuel cells and electrolysis for the generation of hydrogen, for the, the re-electrification of hydrogen. These are systems that we, that we buy from, from suppliers. But then we have, of course, in these systems also the LOHC hydrogen storage part. And as you can see, you have, uh, can have power in the range up until 300 kilowatt, but more importantly, you have um, storage capacity of many megawatt hours. So 30 megawatt hours, for example, would be a 15, 15 cubic meter tank. And this, if you think of your own heating oil tank at home, this is not too large. This is something you can imagine pretty well. And then you have a very large uh, capacity of 30 megawatt hours. Um, of course, if you're talking about this uh, power-to-power electricity um, storage system, you can think of many, many applications. And many of you are experts, I guess, in, in the different scenarios you can, you can think of. Um, we are actually focusing on, on, on two applications, uh, mainly at the moment. And the one on the left side, obviously, is of course like a little bit like the European or German case of um, trying to increase the, the degree of, of self-supply with renewable energies. And if you look at, uh, for example, this is a project we're involved in with residential homes and very large PV installations, then you have, of course, very much excess energy in summer, m in midday, but then you have, of course, a lot of energy demand um, in winter times and, and during night. And if you really see what, what the amount of energy is that you accumulate in summertime that you want to bring to winter, this is really in the range of many megawatt hours, typically. So this is nothing you could cover with a, with a battery, for example. Um, you would need um, chemical storage here. The other one is uh, off-grid applications. Uh, for example, if you think about uh, like our investor Anglo mining applications, off-grid applications in South Africa, for example, then you also need to cover um, quite long storage cycles to go get from day to night to get from summer to winter. And here we also want to combine LOHC technology with existing electro uh, electrolysis and existing fuel cells. Um, so this is actually the, the, the storage system and of course we have, as I said, the electrolyzer fuel cell integrated and then the whole technology we are actually working on, that what, this is our proprietary technology, is the, the, the units that you need for the hydrogenation, so for the loading of the material. These are catalyt catalytic processes, as I have mentioned, so you have a certain catalyst, you have certain pressure and temperature um, uh, um, uh, applications and this is uh, what we do uh, at Hydrogenius. Um, the range of the, the systems goes from, from smaller systems with uh, about 30 kilowatt to larger systems with about one megawatt. And as you see, you can uh, actually uh, build these uh, systems in containers, 20 foot containers um, with, with one or two containers for, for these uh, power um, ratings. Yeah, so I think I'm at the end of the time, but uh, if you have more questions, you can of course ask now, or you can also visit our, our stand here in Hall 27, uh, E551. So we would be, uh, yeah, we would, would be very happy to welcome you there and answer any more questions. Thank you very much for your interest. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for this uh, presentation. Um, I can take a question from the audience at this time. How does the release technology work, and would it be imaginable to have that in a mobile application like a bus? Yeah, in, in automotive applications, it's also very well possible. This was actually a project big car manufacturers have been working on as a first step to integrate it into mobile applications. Um, and this is possible. You have, of course, for the dehydrogenation, a certain temperature that you need. So it's around 270, 300 degrees Celsius. So this is something you would, would have to cover. But uh, it, it is very well possible in our eyes. Our first strategic step is, of course, the stationary application, because this is the first logical step. But the next would be, of course, not to go into small vehicles, but, for example, in a bus, in a ship, uh, and, and, and things like that. So this is very well imaginable.
uh, about the storage application. Uh, what is the maximum temperature due to the environment? Uh, how much does it uh, achieve the maximum level to because of the safety of the hydrogen? Uh, can you tell me a little bit about that? Thank yeah. you. So the temperature is actually needed at, uh, for the dehydrogenation, for, so for the release of hydrogen. So during the complete transportation and storage, it's uh, pressureless, it's at normal temperature, so you need, don't need anything to do anything there. Just for the dehydrogenation, you actually need temperatures around 300 degrees Celsius. Um, but as I said, the, the LHC material itself is a heat transfer fluid from industry, so it's very stable, very resistant to high temperatures. Um, and then, of course, the hydrogen is, is cooled to ambient temperatures and then used in the fuel cell directly. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we are out of time and I have to cut this off here. But you can take your questions directly to Dr. Daniel Teichmann or you can uh, visit them at E55. Once again, thank you for this wonderful presentation. Thanks. In just a few minutes, we'll hear the next presentation by Next Energy about the PEM fuel cell stack testing procedures in the EU project stack test. So that will be just in a few minutes time.